ride with me in my foul life. The Wild Fowl series continues. Have you all been enjoying it? I talked to my co- co-host Skip Knowles quite a bit, and he's just like always. Man, that was a good one. Man, that was a good one. Man, we got a lot out of that. I really feel like we are. We're throwing down for you. We're trying to bring the best of the best. The last episode, we had freaking Chad Mendez on here with George Thompson from Benelli talking shotguns, all manufacturers, all models, 20 gauge, 12 gauge, 28 gauge, 410s for the kids. Mendez told us about his new fights he's got coming up in the Bare Knuckle Boxing League. And today we have what I consider probably the heavyweight champion in the world when it comes to the waterfowl industry over the last two decades. He's done more for goose call design, duck call design, decoy carving design, posturing, realism, texturing, paint jobs, paint schemes, realism. The man, the myth, the legend, Fred Zink, Avian X decoy, Zink Calls is on the show today. Skip, when you hear that name, Fred Zink, do you get all like giddy? Kind of like, remember when Chevy Chase was taking the family to Wally World and he's like, we're all going to the effing fun park? Do you like get that giddy when you hear Fred Zink's name when it comes to duck and goose hunting? He's like the he's like the baseline about which everything else is judged, whether it's calling or how to run a company or uh, how to catch a walleye or eat a ribeye, honestly. No, but everything having to do with duck and goose and turkey hunting, you know, he, he really is the baseline by which everything else is is judged. Don't let it that go to your giant head there, Zinky. I don't think Fred has a big head. Fred Zink, how are you, my brother? Oh, I have actually. I'm doing good. I appreciate the introduction. A little bit bigger than I expected out of you, Chaz. Oh, bullshit. Like you it. know, BS. <laughs> I always give you freaking props. Are you kidding me? <laughs> are you kidding me? The man. What's been going on? What's up? What are we talking about today? Well, we were, you know, we've been talking about, I think we mentioned this to you last year, Freddie, but you've been in this book a lot, 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 probably more than anybody in the history of the magazine. Products, print ad campaigns, instructionals, hunts that were relived through writers like Skip. Um, You know, I've been in camp with you when you've had writers on site. Just in a nutshell, Fred Zink, over your tenure and your career in this industry, which I'm going to say started in, I'm going to say 95, 96, you probably started making a living with the catalog service, Inc. Outdoors and all that. And then it just exploded from there. But what does this magazine, specifically this giant annual gear issue, mean to you when you get open your mailbox or see it at a lodge? What does it mean to you and the Zinc name to know that this magazine's out there? Well, it's obviously the start of what's new. You know, a lot of people uh, being, uh, even being in an industry, I don't know what other uh, manufacturers are making or whether it be guns, camo, ammo, decoys, blinds, what what have you. But it's kind of like when you get uh, the the Cabela's magazine or the Max Prairie Wings uh, magazine, it's what's new, you know. So as a retail, as a manufacturer, it's basically the start of the buying season because a lot of people aren't buying, you know, especially before digital. Before uh, a lot of people are doing launches on social me- media and digital media, you had to wait for magazines just like Wildfowl to come out before you really knew what was new for the year. So it's kind of uh, it's sitting on my uh, desk right here, actually. And uh, it's kind of the deal that uh, it starts what's new, you know, and it talks about the past. Always has good articles. Well, like about Wildfowl. It is a, a lot of how to's. It's a nuts and bolts. It's just not about, you know, successful hunts is about how to do it. And I think that's one thing that they've always stuck to their roots. Um, I grew up watching fishing shows back in the day. There was hardly any hunting shows, but I grew up watching the fishermen. And that magazine and that it taught people how to be more successful on the water. And I think wildfowl has a, a huge part of that of how to make people successful in the field uh, for waterfowl hunting. And it's a, it's just kick-ass magazine. And generally speaking, it's, it's awesome. I love it. How did you, how did you feel like it as, did you feel like you kind of made it the first time you saw your name in there? I'm sure the first time you saw your name, it was probably, you know, your name was getting out there as a contest caller. You were killing geese all over Ohio, Michigan, the Midwest. You, I'm sure I'm assuming that you were probably in an article before you owned a company or were in an ad, were you? Yeah. I was in ads with uh, File Approach and Outlaw Decoys. And I would say it was like 92 or 93, you know, just little corner ads to begin with. And then it got bigger grounds is in there. Myself, foils, 
Um, and we were with Final Approach and Outlaw, two totally different companies. But that's the first time I seen it. It was pretty cool uh, from uh, just a farm boy from Ohio that just kind of cut his teeth chasing uh, these resident geese around here, figured things out on my own, basically to begin with, for sure hunting them to come full circle and see that it was pretty cool. I remember uh, cor- the day. Correct, correct me if I'm wrong, Zinc, but were you also in the ad campaign with McCree and Grounds and the guys for Cornfield Camo at one time? Yeah, yep, yep. Those were like half-page <laughs> ads. I remember those also. Yeah, yeah, that was some dated stuff, but yeah, yep. So I wanted – Skip and I have been talking about how to break down the call section of the magazine, and you are probably the most, you know – on the planet today known for your vocalizations and goose calling and being able to teach those vocalizations more importantly understanding the way geese communicate i know that you're a hell of a duck hunter and a hell of a duck caller too but the question i wanted to start off for skip and i in the audience today fred zinc was the vocabulary of the canada goose seems to me to be way more complex than that of a mallard duck. Not saying blowing a mallard duck call or operating, I should say, a mallard duck call is not difficult. It takes a lot of practice. But when it comes to the overall words spoken, the vocabulary, would you agree that Canada geese have the most complex vocabulary out of any wild game animal on the universe, on the in the world, or especially in North America, let's say? Yeah, I mean, I think geese have probably the most personality of anything, especially... Uh, um, especially giant Canada geese, um, they're very territorial. And so by that, there's a lot of inflections. It's, it's the same note, but it depends on, it's like the difference between your mom whispering at you, talking to you, yelling at you, screaming at you. And that's what I would really say with Canada geese, especially large ones. They're very, very territorial um, and they don't like company close to them. You know, you see it during mating season, what have you. So it's, it's almost like this, there's probably... I don't know. I'd have to write it all down, eight or 10 notes, but there, there's so much intensity difference and volume difference and pitch difference between all of them. It sounds like 20, 30, 40 notes, but it's all just a breakdown of how the geese use it to express their feelings. And if you look at obviously Canada geese, they, they, uh, uh, they uh, pair for life, right? And so a lot of Canada geese, especially growing up here in Ohio, um, a lot of them were neck banded in the uh, past, especially back in the nineties. Right. Um, and a lot of those same geese would nest obviously on the exact same nest every year, they would fight it out with other geese. And so there's a lot of territorial battles and these geese use different inflections of their voice and their pitch and their calls to demonstrate. Basically uh, it's kind of like, uh, they're the fighters of the U of the of the waterfowl world. They're the UFC waterfowl uh, when it comes to just territorial. Uh, whether they're fighting over nesting ground, fighting over a mate, fighting over a water hole, fighting over a food source late in the year, uh, for protecting their young throughout the course of the year. Uh, you watch them. I, I've seen them. You know, basically run coyotes off, run eagles off, run fox off, completely out of the field, uh, run raccoons completely off because they're so brave they're so dominant and they have such a uh, they such a have a will to live and i think we've all seen everybody on this podcast especially you two you know if you hit a snow goose in a toe with a bb he's coming to the earth right <laughs> even though they migrate from way up north all the way to south if you just graze a snow goose they're coming down uh you can hit a canada goose full on uh, with three and a half inch at 50 yards and a lot of times they're going to sail for a ways or they're going to try to get away from me. It's just, they're just a totally different waterfowl species compared to most. Oh, I love hearing you play it down like that. Also, Skip, is there a more dominating, distinctive sound to start to get our blood flowing? You hear a widgeon whistle, you hear a Drake Mallard grunt whistle, you hear a hen mallard, you might hear a pintail sprig whistle, but when you hear a honk and a cluck, flying over or at the park or wherever, you know that you're in the midst of waterfowl. You know what I'm saying, Skip? It's like when you hear that Canada goose, that flock or that single, you know how powerful they are and what it means like to commence the season. You know what, I, you know what I'm getting at, Skip Knowles? He might have us on, on – uh, he puts us on mute sometimes and he forgets. <laughs> he does. I see it on his screen. There you go, big boy. <laughs> rehearsal. Rehearsal. <laughs> 
Be glad, Chad. Listen to my chair. I finally oh, found. The oh, you you oiled it. No, I found it. To, to answer your point, I mean, it is the sound of fall. I mean, if you can hear whether you're up in Canada. We've all been up there uh, and hear them honkers and those lessons <laughs> migrating down the river or out at night. And, and the thing about Canada geese are so widespread from east coast to west coast, north to south. Uh, you know, if you go back in the day, there wasn't that many Canada geese any further south than, say, Tennessee, Kentucky, uh, Illinois, in the central. Uh, I'm talking about large Canada geese. And then when you get to Texas, it would be Canada geese. But there's a lot of places, Alabama, uh, uh, Arkansas, a lot of times they didn't see it. But now with the resident population, they're as far down there as they go. They're molt migrating back and forth. And so the sound of fall was pretty much like the Canada goose migrating, you know. Uh, you get in the Midwest, uh, along the Mississippi River, the Missouri River right there at night, you hear the snow geese migrating, or you could be in a deer stand uh, in Kansas along the Missouri and listen to the, uh, the specks and the snows migrating. But there's nothing like the sound of Canada geese migrating in the fall. That's absolutely right. And uh, when, you, when you hear them migrating, that's, that's a beautiful – when you hear ducks calling and ducks chattering and everything, it's exciting and we like it. But, but really, people don't name um, – you know, whiskey brands and movies often, the wild beef, all that. There's a, there's a mystique about them. It, it's amazing. And um, I tell people, uh, duck hunting is the most fun, by and large. The goose hunting is as close as you get um, in the waterfowling world to to the big game. And when they're coming in low on the deck, and they're 200 yards out, and they stop paddling, and it's just a... <laughs> if anything, not even a cluck, just kind of groaning and at you. I call them sky pigs, not disrespectfully, but just because they kind of wink at you. Or sometimes come in silent, and when they're on you and they're circling and they're right behind you and you can't shoot them, I swear there's a creaking noise with their wings and a flushing noise with their feathers. You just don't get anything else that completely unwinds you. You have to tell yourself, i got to remember to breathe here. Okay, am I ready? Am I going to be ready? Am I on the right birds? But it's, it, there's an intensity with these that... that that you don't find as much else. They're, they're very, very smart, especially when hunted in pressured areas. Uh, out of all the birds I've probably ever hunted, um, they definitely are consistently probably the toughest to fool um, when conditions aren't in your favor. Uh, and I'm talking about Canada geese that are resident style geese that's been hunted for September, October, November, December, and they're resident geese and they've been around. Uh, to call them to, into a flock of or uh, spread of decoys in an open field with ground blinds or blinds and have them land at your feet. Uh, with not having some type of weather condition can be extremely difficult. I, I know, especially here in the, in the Midwest where there's so many hunters. Uh, it didn't used to be that way. It used to be very, very easy, but that's them days have gone since, I'll be honest with you, a lot of those days have been gone since the mid-90s, and that's just the truth. Now, you can get in areas in the Midwest where uh, Canada geese are not getting hassled on a daily basis, but around here, uh, to be honest with you, most of them carry a f flashlight. I think they get a, a shipment from Amazon about twice a week with batteries or get flashlights back on their head. Yeah, they. to be honest with you, they, after about uh, two, three weeks of season here, uh, you typically will not see them fly during the daylight whatsoever um, until late in the year when it gets cold and they have to go feed. They're pretty smart and pretty educated. Do you <clears> – <throat> would you say they're your favorite, Fred Zink? I know you love mallards, but would you say that uh, hunting Canada's are your favorite? Uh, no, I would say definitely like mallards in the sunshine is, is my is my favorite because they're more predictable, um, and uh, they, a lot of times they will move in the daylight. It, it's because of where I live. You know, if I lived out in the Midwest where you could randomly go anytime you wanted and shoot Canada geese, I, I still love them because they're uh, they're a challenge. They're difficult to shoot. There's a lot of things you have to do to be successful, but just because of where I live, Chad, I just don't have the opportunity uh, to shoot them throughout the course of the year. Like I say, early in the year, yes. Late in the year, yes. When the snow falls, it gets cold. Plenty of time to shoot Canada geese. But, like, to be honest with you, November, December, maybe a little January, depends on the weather conditions. Uh, mostly November, December, extremely difficult to have a Canada goose hunt around the, these parts anymore. When, when you start talking. crazy, but it's true. We're, when we're breaking down the call section, Fred Zink, a lot of people are probably going to hunt, you know, in their general area. In the continental United States, a lot of those general areas are of the bigger goose variety. Some are like the front right. range of Colorado. You get over into Kansas a little bit, you get a lot of lessers. Um, what do you tell somebody 
what are the steps to getting the right call? You've been in this game long enough and you've educated people on the, like, I remember the story you told of when you, your lovely wife, Dawn would see my number come through on caller ID. She'd be like, it's, it's that really weird dude from Nevada calling again for the 15th time this week to learn how to blow a goose call. But you've done you so a much, lot of, passion, Chad. <laughs> a lot of, of persistence, but you have a yeah. lot of, you've taught a lot of people how to do this in today's world. There's a lot of options out there on calls to right. buy. How do you, how do you do it? How do you go about getting the right one for you to, to be successful? Because it's not easy to be successful on a daily basis, but the calling and the vocalizations is one of my favorite parts. And I think that as a right. duck and a goose hunter, it's going to become your favorite part too, besides the dog. Maybe it's the best part about what we get to do is talking to him. You know what I mean? hundred percent, hundred percent. I think the most important part, and there's a lot, a lot of good calls out there today compared to what they used to be. Uh, if you look back in the day, there were probably only a handful of call makers that actually make good quality goose calls. And that was just the truth. Um, you know, I don't want to leave anybody out, but if you weren't uh, a Tim Grounds, uh, a Hess call, uh, a Sean Mann call, um, a Ron Winicky call, uh, a modified old 850, which would be a, you know, a Gary McCree or Alan McCree. Uh, there weren't too many other good calls out there. I mean, there just simply wasn't. Uh, Glenn Scolby made a good traditional style call, you know, uh, a Ken Martin back in the day. And there's some old, like old 800s. That was the beginning. And then it kind of rolled over. And then with some people like Nightingale come out with a tube style call that uh, has won the world a couple times, live goose three, three, four times. There wasn't really that many good call makers out there because the fact was, unless you were from Eastern shore of Maryland, Delaware, something like that, Kentucky, Tennessee, Illinois, uh, there wasn't that many good goose callers in the whole entire continental USA. I mean, there just wasn't simply because of the fact that uh, there wasn't that good of calls out there or and or instruction. But come along, come uh, basically the first form of somewhat you would say digital media would be, uh, uh, you know, uh, D uh, DVDs or VHS tapes, which allowed someone like me growing up in Ohio. Number one, I was lucky enough to meet Tim Grounds. Uh, but number two, I was I got cassette tapes. I could watch what he was doing, listen to what I was doing. I was talented enough that I could figure it out on my own. And now there's been an explosion of call makers. And I think a lot of it has to do with two things. Number one, digital media has taught a lot of people how to blow calls. Uh, I remember Foils and I going to game fair and we'd sell calls. Literally we'd have 15 to 20 deep at the booth with money in our hand, just coming up. Cause we blow goose calls. That was just like, it was crazy. Like there was just this wall of people around our booth all the time. And because they'd never heard anybody sound like that or be able to do all that. And that was like in the mid to late nineties, somewhere early 2000s, something like that. But with digital media, YouTube, uh, all this uh, digital media that's out there, people were able to, number one, get good content, which is number one rule. But number two, um, CNC turning centers have really changed it all. If you look back in the day when like grounds were making calls or, or Sean Mann, a lot of them were done with very antiquated old school metal lace, uh, made out of wood, things like that. Uh, hard to duplicate over and over and over. And then when they started making a curlic, those wooden or the steel lays didn't have the coolant systems involved in them. Uh, when when and they would turn a curlic, they would chatter and chap up and not very good quality calls at all. But the first acrylic calls I seen were very, very crude because they couldn't get enough coolant on to really turn it and that acrylic would get hot, right? So with the evolution of CNC machines and the high pressure CNC coolants on there and things like that, all of a sudden, you know, you can buy a really good, like our production CNC mills and, and turning centers we have are like $60,000. A good steel mill or turning center was, it could be even way more than that, but didn't have the capability. So good content, digital content, and then the ability to build good call, quality calls as it exploded since the early 2000s and now the landscape is full of different call makers here's what i would say about how to pick a call uh even though there's a lot of call makers out there um and, and this is just my opinion and and i've told people that work for me i've told people because we turn calls for other manufacturers as well and i've said this a couple of times i think it kind of pisses people off 
uh, maybe Bruce Amigos, but I, t- I always told them, until you tune at least 500 of that particular goose call, that skew, you won't have it figured out. And that's what I, tr- I've tuned thousands of calls and that's what I truly believe because you get in a rhythm. And when you're first, say you got like a, a new call that you come out with and you're trying to figure out how to tune it. Yeah, you might tune one. It sounds awesome. But can you tune 2,000 of them or 500 of them that sound that awesome? And I'll tell you the answer. And the answer is typically no. Not until you make enough of them over and over and over. And then you get to where it's so good where you can just do it with your eyes closed. But that takes a lot of practice. A lot of small call makers don't actually make enough calls or tune enough calls, in my opinion, to really have them dialed up. Um, And the other thing is, um, you know, just getting with a reputable call company that number one makes a good quality call has a good reputation and has some background in contest calling i think is important because uh, there's a reason why ford and chevy and uh, toyota and all these people run races is because that technology comes over into the manufacturing of everyday drivers because of the suspensions and the motors and the weight distribution and all that stuff same way with goose calls and when you're at a top level at the contest stage and trying to figure things out, when that all boils down, that goes in your day-to-day drivers, you know? And so what I would say at Zinc, the one thing that I always try to pride myself on is I never really try to build contest calls. What I always tried to do is build a call that was loud, but easy to blow. Um, and the reason why I like loud is because you can always blow a loud call soft, but you can never blow a soft call loud. And majority of people don't have enough air to blow like a call like you and I would blow, Chad. I would take, um, when I was tuning calls, I would tune, you know, I don't know, go to the show and have 200 calls. And I would be tuning them. And I would always have a couple of them, five or 10 of them, that were just so easy to blow that I'd go to fix them because I didn't like them. I'm like, no, 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 they could be a kid or because uh, always have, you know, adults mom and dad bring their kid up and say, I'd like to buy a nice call for my son or daughter. What would you recommend? And I always have them set somewhere on that table or, or that call rack where I knew where they were. But I, people would always come to your booth, pick up the calls, blow them. The first five or 10 that would sell every time would be those easy calls. And they were not selling to kids. They were selling to your average guy that was just looking for a call that was easy to blow. So by watching that show after show after show, what I realized is, that the calls that I like, calls you like, Chad, calls that Tim Grounds and Hunter Grounds personally like and have on their lanyard, couldn't give them away because they're just so hard to blow and they're just so much different than what your average person that wants to go shoot a goose would actually really like. So you're saying that to go and pick a call right now, there's a few things. Find a manufacturer that's reputable, good customer service, like yep. buying a shotgun, one that fits you. But the whole reputation thing is a very good point of, well, how does this consumer know that these calls are all going to be consistent to the right way? Not everybody that's coming into the goose call center, you know, market right now knows your, you know, how many calls Fred Zink and his team have tuned, right? So right. How, how do we look for that? What do we look for in the tuning of a call? When you pick it up, do you hold it in between your fingers like a whistle and just blow into it and see what you get? What are we looking for when we pick that call up? Because these can be intimidating. Yeah, they can be. I, th- I think the people that have just been doing it for so long uh, have it down to where, you know, a, a good a, a good person that can tune calls, I can look at them and tell you if they'll blow or not, not even blow it. I can just simply tune it, look at it with, and look at it and say, no, that's not right, or this will blow. It'll be hard to blow, whatever. Uh, the, the curvature of the reeds, um, I'd say that's probably the, one of the biggest things. Once you have a set of guts and a goose call that actually works, then having that consistency in the reed material, and the consistency of the mylar because mylar is similar to like paint or a uh, 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 wood finish and things like that is they're always changing your supply sometimes always changing even though they say oh yeah this is a mylar reed and eh, it could be different than the one you were using last year so we have an in-house process that we put our reed material through that actually changes the reed so it's every reed that we put in our call is exactly the same as the hundreds before the thousands before 
And it took us a long time to figure that out. Prior to that, it was just random of what they would be. You know, so number one, a reputable call maker. But another thing is with all these different people out there making these custom calls, a lot of times there's someone in your neighborhood. You know what I mean? It could be a guy an hour away. It could be a guy at your local DU event or, or what have you that's making some calls or whatever. And he comes and does a seminar, does, and he sounds good. And you talk to him and he can blow the hell out of a goose call. That might be the call you want to go by. It probably is because some of the fact that uh, you're going to get some really hands-on service with that fella. Uh, you can sit down and go over to his house. I mean, I've had hundreds and hundreds of people uh, come to my shop over the years. Uh, look at what uh, R&T has been able to build as far as the world championship and the amount of championships that they've been able to accomplish simply because of Butch Richmond back taught so many people how to contest call. It's crazy. And because of that, the success on the stage of the world championship is owned by RNT simply because of Butch. And now obviously Jimbo and John and those guys, but it started with the ability to teach people how to blow a call. So reputable brand that you feel comfortable with if you don't have that contact, but if you have somebody local that is a state champion or competes in calling contests and builds a good call, that's also a very, very good avenue. And what? And before I let Skip go to his question, I know he's got several. Short read is that what most people are going to get into calling county geese. There was the flute call and the long call. You were amazing on a flute call for several years. Um, but when it comes to short read calls, is there still a such thing as a shaved read? I think Primo's even had a call at one time called the shaved read shorty or something. But do you shave a read still? Or do you... When you go to look for a call and I'm at that counter, isn't isn't this a big part of it of how durable that read is, how thin that read is? Does shaving a read make it not as goosey? Because I, I'm trying to figure out as a new consumer, like, where do I go with my read? You mentioned the curvature of the Mylar read, Fred Zink. But what about, do you take some of that Mylar off the top of it as a manufacturer? And am I looking for that as a consumer? And with custom calls, you're going to find out in most cases, we only have an, uh, the only call that we don't shave or read on is a naughty by nature, which is short style call. It's one of my favorite, uh, but we don't shave the read. And But all other, every skew that we've ever made in the history of zinc since 2000, we shaved every read. But every read is unique to that style, not that particular call, but that style. Um, there's areas where you shave on a reed to create different frequencies, whether you want a little softer, more uh, that rubbery sounding goose, uh, a little quicker uh, as far as finesse, you shave someplace else. Um, there's a lot of different things, and it's kind of like a, it, it's true talent. Tuning the call is, is somewhat hard. Uh, shaving a reed is very, very difficult to uh, the unknown. Like if you don't know how to shave a reed, you just think you grab a knife and shave a reed and it's good. No, that's where when I told you about, you know, I told people, you got shave and you got to tune 500 calls. It's not really the tuning part. You got to shave about 500 reeds and to figure out because it's the feel. Uh, you're talking about hand pressure, uh, a sharp edge, hand pressure on a mylar reed, and you're taking material off. And you're not talking about a machined uh, deal where it's exactly the same every time. It's a talent. It's earned something like tuning a guitar, tuning a brass instrument, what have you. It's something that happens over time. And that's why I always consi consistently say the best calls are typically made by the, pe the people that can blow the calls the best and have been doing it the longest. It's just the more knowledge you have, uh, the better chances of you going to make a better duck call, goose call, turkey call, what have you. Skip, when you hear Fred Zink talk like this and you apply it to what you know you can do on a short read goose call, personally, yourself, you live in Colorado, a lot of Canada geese to be hunted around you in the states that are next door to you. Do you feel that you've accomplished what you want to on a short read goose call, Skip Knowles? And if you have not, why have you not? And what's it going to take to get you there? Because the, like Freddie Zink just told us, it, the knowledge is out there. We can find content to teach us. But to get into the field and actually get those sounds like Freddie can make, woo, 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 like, I mean, I've heard the guy just do some unreal shit on a call for lessers, cacklers, big geese. Do you want to get there, Skip? What's holding you back if you haven't got there? I've never heard you blow a goose call, but you should be able to, right, Skip Knowles? Oh, it's, it's so fun living what I do because you can learn to the most 
highly pressured birds up on the top of the front range, those, uh, those big squads of lessers. And you see guys get frustrated and shoot into them when they're only 60 yards up and they, they shouldn't shoot A into a huge flock because they're educating 1,500 geese. And B, they're just slightly out of range. It's like, okay, they just made 1,500 geese completely unkillable. And I hunt with a bunch of killers here who could call much better than me. And they'll talk all evening about guts on calls and everything else. And they blow a lot, um, <clears throat> which I think is appropriate with lessers. But then sometimes I'll walk, wander over to the eastern border over near Kansas and uh, we'll encounter giants that are just incredibly naive they barely just need a few clucks and you can totally turn birds one time me and my brother-in-laws were hunting poor boy style in a in a dirt field which i learned later is actually something that can work for you because geese don't really expect danger from bare dirt fields because nobody hunts in them and if you're a poor boy and you get in there with a bunch of decoys hide in them with burlap you can you can really do some damage but i remember the first time about 10 years ago when i really turned a bunch of geese um, and was learning to blow a, a call of death, actually, a zinky call. And uh, I'm like, guys, I don't think I can turn these geese. But uh, I w we'd gotten caught. We'd gotten busted. Everyone hit the dirt face down when these geese came over a pivot at about uh, 150 yards. And I just turned away from them. I didn't even have my gun. I was away from my gun. and just gave it a bloop, 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 bloop. And they, they all turned, snapped their heads and turned and came in and committed suicide. My buddies didn't shoot that well. But um, that's when... You know, the first time you really, you pull a bunch of birds in like that, you never forget it. And uh, no, I'm not nearly where I want to be with a short read goose call. I've had three kids in five years and I don't get to practice at home because <laughs> goose calls are loud. And uh, no, I have a long way to go. I have a very limited vocabulary. What I do, I'm very confident in and I like it, but um, but I have a lot to learn. Uh, I still can't sound like 15 geese like, like guys like, like Fred and you. Um, but this does raise a question, Chad. I was talking about how the goose calls are so loud. I got new hardwood floors in here, and now I can't even blow inside without earplugs. They're so loud, you know. And uh, we talk a lot about how loud to call. We have all different style duck calls to blow quietly or loud, depending on the time of year, the season, how the birds are acting and where you're at. I wanted to ask Fred a little bit about that. It doesn't come up with, with geese a lot. Like I said, my friends, when we hunt up near Fort Collins, they kind of go crazy. Blah, 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 blah. And they're just like trying to call um, nonstop really loudly. And I wonder if that's really the answer. So I wonder if you could talk about, is there a time to blow a quieter goose call or a louder one and, and help inform some of the, the, the listeners, some of the audience that, that aren't at y'all's level of expertise of, about that? Yeah. Because you did mention as well, um, 20 years ago, it was really something to hear someone go off on a short read. Now there's a lot of 10 year olds who can call it just beautifully, you know? Yeah. And that's the reason why it's changed so much is because geese are really conditioned to that now, just like what your buddies are calling uh, a lot, especially when you're calling last year, you got two or three guys that can really blow a call and you're making that wall of sound and can be extremely effective, um, especially hunting lesser candidates. Um, it can even be effective hunting big honkers when they're not coming your way. You're just trying to get their attention attention to come towards you. Um, but here's what I would say. The most important part about calling ducks um, and especially calling geese, uh, because ducks, you're looking at uh, body posture, kind of what they're doing. You're trying to anticipate what they're thinking, whether they're confused, whether they're delivered, are they going to come, they're going to go, what are they doing? Where a Canada goose can tell you that from a long way away, even without body posture, simply because of their vocalism. Canada geese, when they're quiet, they're they're nervous, uh, and when they're very vocal, uh, they're very very relaxed. And so, if uh, if you hear a bunch of geese coming your way, and you and your buddies just start wailing at them, you can't see them, but you hear them coming. You get to start calling, and those geese come up over the tree line, and they see your decoy spread. Okay, and they shut up. That means they're nervous. But if you're blowing at them wide open and you can't hear that, the chances of you calling those geese in are probably extremely low because you have smart geese. Now, when your buddies are calling at, at geese uh, wide open, which my buddies and I do it a lot too, we're not trying to kill, we're not trying to fool smart geese. Okay. Like when you're at Crab Orchard back in the day in Il Southern Illinois and there's, you know, 700,000 Canada geese in between crab and, and grassy and Ballard County and horseshoe and all those lakes, 700,000 geese. 
those geese fly out. And this is a sea of pits. And in those days, they were all black shadows, uh, outlaws, real geese, uh, Bigfoots everywhere. We would kill 50 to 100 geese in one field a day. And it was like, wow, that's a lot of candy geese. But you would have 30,000 of them fly over your head, right? At the end of the day, you had to have a pile of geese, but there was a majority of them was so smart that they were not going to stop there. And so when you're in the situation where you're just blowing and you're in an area where they're, they're migrating through or there just was a cold front come down and the geese are all of a sudden going to start feeding, maybe they've been sent for two or three days and they're going to feed or they're migrating in, what you're trying to do is really just prey on the new geese to the area. You're, you're, you're looking for inexperienced geese and the guys that are calling a lot, have run big spreads and flagging, those are the spreads that those geese are going to go to. They're looking for a party, a lot of noise, a lot have you. Now, say it, it gets warm, it gets in the mid 50s, you know, for 10 days or a week right there in, in November, uh, December, January in Colorado where you are, that opportunity is gone, right? So that's when uh, calling a lot, a lot of times won't work. You know, I've seen lessers where if you blew your call at all, they wouldn't come to you. Uh, so reading the can of geese, and you can read them by body posture, but one of the best ways is read them by their vocalism of how much they're calling. If, the, if they're quiet and they come up over the tree line or, or the pivot, and then they see your decoys and then they start calling, then that means they're very relaxed and the chances of you getting those geese to come in are very good. And mm -hmm. so call, start to call at them back is a very, very good thing. I think uh, one thing that I see a lot of people make a mistake at doing and I base my knowledge on calling uh, from the very beginning from other guides, right? My grandpa, my dad, guides that I guided with. And then as I got more and more advanced into contest calling, I started spending a lot of time with Canada geese himself. And I spent hundreds of hours uh, feeding them at parks, feeding them in refuges uh, after the season, uh, season uh, laying in cornfields, watching them. And, you know, a Canada goose at a city park, eating out of your hand has the same mannerisms, in my opinion, as a wild goose. And so by going to a park or an area where they're coming in on the water and maybe they're 100 yards away, 50 yards away, five feet away, and watching what those geese do, how they interact with other geese, the first thing you'll find out is uh, when they get nervous, they quit calling, number one. Number two, they quit moving. Mm -hmm. So a lot of decoy spreads back in the day, and I'm not picking on Bigfoot's, uh, because they were the most kick-ass decoy ever made in their time without the revolutionized goose hunting for a period of time, no question about it, but they didn't have any emotion. And I seen to where it went from, you know, if you had Bigfoot's out, you'd shoot every goose that came by you. And, and, and in Ohio, simply because of the popularity of them and everybody was hunting over them, by the mid nineties, if you had any of them out, you couldn't decoy geese. Not, not, not geese that were uh, local and been there for a while. Migrating geese, uh, uh, front geese where they had to feed because of, of snow, different goose. But I'm talking about smart geese. Couldn't do it. So in the mid-90s, I, I used stuffers. I started mounting my own uh, 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 decoys. And then I had silhouettes. It wasn't that silhouettes were more uh, or a better decoy than a Bigfoot. It's just they were different, right? And so changing that game up. But what you'll see when Canada geese are quiet, that means they're nervous. And when they quit moving, they're nervous. So um, a lot of people will make the, the, the old assumption, and it's been talked about over and over and over again. So there's probably most people in, on this podcast going to know this, but the worst thing you can do is be blowing your goose call. You and your body's pretty, pretty much wide open or pretty fast, making quite a bit of noise. And as soon as the geese lock up, shut up. A lot of people, that's how they used to do it. Say, oh, you don't want to mess them up because you know they're locked up and they're set up. Don't do anything to mess it up. The Canada geese, and I'm not talking about people, I'm talking about really Canada geese on the ground feeding. As the geese in the air get closer to them, that's when they pick up their intensity of their calling uh, and their dominance. And they actually raise their pitch to a higher pitch, a sharper pitch, a faster cadence, and more volume because they're really defending their food source, whether or their roost spot or their nest or what have you. Uh, Canada geese that's got up off a of roost and flew 10, 15 miles out to a cornfield in January in Colorado went zero. 
and he's walking around this field of frozen tundra with four inches of snow on it, and he finds an ear of corn, does it even sound possible that that can of goose is giving a green call and a, hey, come over here and eat my corn call and whatever? No. What they're trying to do is defend their territory, them and their family group. And you can really see it in like July, August, or maybe July, August, especially. And even in September when they're defending the young of the year, you know, Um, the first time I really discovered this uh, and really started to understand this was uh, watching snow geese feed. And I, and I was in North Dakota. This had been like, I say ninth three or ninth four or something like that. And I seen an adult snow goose, what I believe to be a male can't a uh, male uh, snow goose in a field for over two and a half hours and never fed one time. Had his head up. I was in a ditch, just watching them, trying to learn what they're doing. And the juveniles in the flock. And the, the easiest part about snow geese, you can tell exactly which ones juvies with at a glance because they're, you know, they're a blue is all, all gray and a snow is real dirty. Right. And the juvies never picked their head up one time, but that adult male would walk that fence line past them about 30 yards, stand there and look around in a sentry mode, never move. And those juvies would feed up to him and pass him. And he'd turn around and walk past them again. He was on look for coyotes, birds of prey, hunters, what have you. And so once I started seeing that, I started studying the postures of Canada geese uh, to the point, And this is when I really learned it is I would help them band a Canada geese. Okay. And a male Canada goose is much stronger than a female Canada goose and definitely much stronger than a, a juvenile Canada goose. And so it didn't take me long to be able to look at a pen of a hundred geese. And I could tell you every male in there, because when you pick them up, you pick them up by the wing and pin their wings back and you pull them like that. And you carry one in each hand over to the guy that's going to sex them and, and band them. Right. So number one, you take them over, he sex them, male, female, male, 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 female, and you feel the strength of there. Well, after you do this for about three days and you've banded, you know, you've carried a couple hundred can of geese and we'd always have interns or young people there. I would never pick up a male can of goose because it would just wear your, you know, your hand would be worn out. You couldn't hardly do it after a while. So I just pick up juvies and females. And as soon as you grab them, they just give up and you take it over there and they'd be over in the corner wrestling these males that was <laughs> not going to give up. And, and so it didn't take me long to figure out the postures and the personalities of males, females, and juvenile Canada geese. Now, to a lot of people, and especially novices, they look out and they say, well, there's a bunch of Canada geese here. But I can tell you which one the male is, which one the female is, which one of the juvies of the year, even in November, December, because of the personalities or posture size as well. And that helped me when we started making our decoys because I actually, we actually designed uh, decoys that look like male, female, and juvies. And when I would set my rig, I would set it up so it looked like that, simply because it was just another form of communication to the geese of where the food is, where the food's not. Here's a bunch of juvies. Here's the males. Here's the dominant geese. What have you? And the the key to to being successful in waterfowl hunting is number one, you got to be where they want to be. You got to hide from them, look like them, and sound like them. That's only four simple rules, but those are very hard four rules to complete on a daily basis. Uh, And the hardest one in highly hunted areas is finding the spot because of leases. You know, the amount of leases that's going on today, uh, you might only have two or three spots, so you might have to hunt them more than than you should simply because you had no other spots. So number one is find a good location. Uh, that number two is, is hiding from them. I think that's where a majority of people go wrong um, is overlooking that aspect of it and not understanding how important that is. That's the number two rule to be successful with anything, especially Canada ge- or geese in general. Ducks, uh, I think they see differently. I don't know if they're not as smart. I, obviously, they're smart ducks, and there's people on this podcast that go, oh, you don't hunt where I hunt. I've hunted all over. And the comparison between the two is not comparable in my eyes. Uh, ducks are just easier to fool a lot of times, especially with the invention of spinners and what have you, right? And then obviously your decoy spread, making sure you have a good de- decoy spread. And then we gives it down to the calling, understanding how to read the geese and a lot of us listening to them communicating back with them. And I can sit here and talk to you about what note means what, what have you, uh, just remember a good rule of thumb is, is when geese are the loudest and the sharpest and the fastest, it means that they're protecting something. 
And if they're in the field and they're that aggressive in the field, that means there's food. Okay. And if they're pretty subdued in the field and not calling and other geese are going in and land with them and they're just kind of walking around looking, that means there's not much there to defend. Okay. And I've seen it down at Grassy Lake. You go to down at Colin Kane's place down there, they'd be 20, 30,000 black silhouettes and all kinds of decoys in that field, like a huge field had pits in it. But when those geese decoyed into that, that, uh, that spread of that huge spread of all those decoys, you know where they always decoyed? They always decoyed to the pits. Why mm -hmm. is that? Because that's where the calling came from. That's where the sound come from. And the geese that they're in that area are defending something. There's agitation going on. Agitation is when you have two geese on the ground fighting over something or in a cornfield is fighting over corn, right? Or a family groups fighting over territory because there's a food source there. One flock has found it. The other one family groups trying to get it. And so when them geese always land, it was like, why do they always go to the pit and get shot? Because the agitation is where the food source is. It's mm -hmm. kind of like, and, and that's kind of the way to do it. Just take what I kind of say and go out and watch geese. You can spend a couple hours at a city park watching how they fight and how the territorial they are. And we'll take long to figure out how can the geese communicate. Damn it, Skip Knowles. Have you ever been educated like this? Man, I swear, Mr. I, I was just grinning my butt off here. And, and I just want to say, I was like, I, I almost can't even imagine ever getting to listen to, to Fred and you guys go at it and Fred particularly talk about this and, and not learn something. That's amazing. I never thought about geese expressing their emotions like that and how much I tend to think of them as like the grownups and the ducks as the children. You know, I don't know if that's a, a weird reach, but geese do seem by and large longer lived and smarter. Um, but I was laughing, talking about um, them defending their food source. I never thought of it that way either. So, Freddie, are you, yeah. are, are you saying that in so many words, let's end it like this, Freddie, because we could go on for hours and we should do part two to this because this is just a very interesting conversation. But when you say the agitation and the defending, I picture the Michael Jackson beat it video okay there's a gang fight you got michael and his crew over here you got these other badass dancers over here and they're going at it and they're saying beat it beat it and that pisses these guys off and they come at it more even though they're being told to get lost they're right. going to come because so is that what you're saying is going on like birds of a feather flock together it's not necessarily the case with canis mallard ducks are maybe like hey come in the water the temperature's fine but you're saying that there's a gang fight going on and there the geese on the ground are being like get the hell out of here those geese turn away and then when they turn away, the geese on the ground are more like, that's what we thought. You you know, we're way tougher. And you, so the geese in the air hear that and they're like, oh, wait, we ain't going to let them talk smack to us. So that's really the comeback call is them hearing that they're agitated because the geese on the ground are saying, hey, we found the food first and we're defending it. Yeah, that, that's pretty much how it goes. Uh, 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 you know, when a goose is doing a murmur, uh, he's just you got to think when they're looking, obviously, when, but when they're in monocular vision, that's mean when they're looking down at the ground they can't really see to the left and right up when they're truly feeding, right? So you have a goose does a murmur, a turkey will do the purr and, and ducks do a feed chatter, right? It's, I am here, uh, scientists will call it something called a spacing call, okay? It's, I am here, where are you, right? And as another goose gets too close to them or a duck gets too close to them, that, that uh, uh, murmur gets more aggressive. It's basically a warning to move out of my space. Kind of like dudes in a locker room, right? You only get so close. There's a man circle there. Birds are just that way because they're, you know, the wild birds are wild animals. So this ain't like a, a bunch of friends sitting around eating. They got a, a cooler full of steak. These can of geese might not have eaten for two or three days uh, and they're out in the field. And the other thing you got to look at, it, just as a side note, uh, when I grew up, uh, you'd go out in a farmer's cornfield and there would be corn laying everywhere like everywhere. Uh, and this has a lot to do with the common reason why a lot of the ducks, in my opinion, uh, don't go to Arkansas like they used to, is because the commercial, number one, the seeds mature much quicker. Des gestation periods become a lot shorter. So seeds develop. They're able to pick um, corn, say like in October, November, versus back in the day, it'd be November, January, and then you would get snow, knock it down, and they would come in with combines, and the combines with some old international or a gleaner, and it'd be corn laying everywhere in the field. Now, and you get a guy with a brand new John Deere, and he's harvesting in, in October, 
and the shatterproof on the ears are way better and it used to be the husk are much tighter the stalks are much tighter because of all this genetics that they made this corn you know if you took a, a, a cup uh, empty coffee can and walked around your coffee cup and say hey fill this corn this coffee cup up with kernels of corn in a half an hour i guarantee you most places in the midwest where they're harvesting 250 300 bushel uh an acre of corn you couldn't do it because there's not much food there and that's changed arkansas all the rice there's not as much spent rice in the fields anymore it's all harvested and the grain you remember when we just started going back in the Canada way back in the day, Chad, we never seen corn there, right? You, I very seldom seen corn in North Dakota until the late nineties. And now you go to the bush Canada and they're planting corn, seed corn or seed corn uh, for harvest and for silage all the way to the bush in Canada. That's what happened to all the Canada geese back in the day used to go to Virginia. If you look at all the Jack Miner history, if you look at it, it'd be uh, North Carolina, Virginia. That's where a majority of all those Jack Miner bands were killed back in the day. But when they uh, got shorter uh, day corn, and then they started planting on the Eastern shore of Maryland and then Delaware, all those Canada geese that used to go down there didn't go there anymore because they didn't have to. And now it's up in New York. Now it's in Southern Ontario. It's in Northern Ontario and it's changed things. And so the Canada goose, uh, has become has evolved a lot. If you go back in the day, very seldom you would see can geese, geese grazing in a yard or something like that. They were pretty much eating grain uh, and things like that, wheat stubble, uh, uh, winter wheat, cornfields, things like that. Now, because of the lack of food in kernel corn and wheat, barley, a lot, it's hard to find oat fields. It's hard to find that because of quality of the seed, quality of the plant, quality of the combines, what have you. The farming practices now the geese have evolved can the geese are probably uh, when it comes to conservation probably the biggest success them and white-tailed deer that's happened in the united states since white man came here and screwed everything up is because they've been able to evolve tremendously and now can the geese and generally have become grazers more so you know if you drive through the city you go to golf courses you drive through chicago any major city there's Canada geese everywhere and what are they feeding on typically a majority of the time grass you know so that agitation deal is a is a byproduct of who they are they're they're wild animals wild birds and they're defending what they need to survive fred zinc you should so do the, the world goes right along with it you should do the world a favor and start your own podcast i think you were going to at one time is this still in the future yeah it's possible i'm thinking about it i mean you i never was... sent me that information remember yes i did <laughs> <laughs> i know i did no hey i bet you 20 Tom never sent it to you. I introduced you to Tom on an email. You better get twenty dollars from Tom because you're gonna need to hand that over next time I see you, big boy. I'm a, I'm gonna rip some. I'm just kidding. <laughs> I'll make sure. Well, are you still looking to do it? Yeah, I'm. It's possible. Yeah, it's possible. I'm thinking about doing it. I just kind of like to do it from aspect waterfowl and then everything else we're doing. We're been managing whitetail and doing some really cool things. So just more of a hunting lifestyle. Um, I want you to call it this about conservation. I want you, know, you to call it this. I want you to call there's it. Th- hey, there's a lot of things to talk about on the, on the, on the waterfowl side, whether it be, you know, uh, game laws and, and, you know, the season dates and all the different things that are, I, I guess my bigger hang up, and this is kind of a side note, but my biggest hang up, and I think you'll follow right along with this, Chad, is, uh, not that the game laws aren't black and white, but when you start getting into the baiting situation and natural agricultural practice, it is not black and white. And it's very, very scary for people like you and I and Skip that's making or or, or, uh, living in the waterfowl world because it's up to the discretion of the game officer. Well, what the hell does that mean? You know, what's, what's legal, what is not legal and like in the state of Ohio, if you get caught hunting candy geese in a sweet corn patch, you're going to get a ticket, right? What's natural agricultural practice, but I hunt up in Michigan with the game warden and the biologist, and we hunt sweet corn patches. Well, what's the difference, you know? And so as a per, you know professional hunter or someone makes her living in the, uh, the outdoor world, it scares the shit out of me be honest with you it really does because it's not a black and white situation and then the tagging with birds and then the whole party hunting you know like 
you shoot your birds, you shoot your six, you shoot your six, you put them in a pile. Well, which one's your six type of deal? And I'm not saying that's right or wrong, but man, it's not really a black and white situation. There's a lot of things to discover. Uh, and there's a lot of things as hunters that we could help uh, probably spearhead to make sure that we get stuff a little bit more black and white. Should we? Well, you said we. Sh- should we start a podcast together? Is that, are you inviting me in on starting one with you? Well, I think you got a lot of ideas too. You see it. I know you fear. Well, let's you do know. it. I think. I think that I, what I, I fear I've every had day. fear of going and hunting a field that's baited that I don't know about. Um, when we were traveling doing uh, DVDs and we were hunting doing TV shows all the time, I'd get opportunities and people call me up all the time. Hey, come hunt with me or whatever. As much as I wanted to go do that, I was in fear of what I didn't know. Not so much of whether I would have a good hunt or a good time. It's just, I don't know this individual. You know, I show up at four o'clock in the morning or the night before we scout a field, pick out where we're going to hunt or whatever, go out there in the morning. And you, you never know. This guy could be feeding. Uh, someone else could have uh, 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 fed it. A good friend of mine is a game warden uh, in the state of Ohio actually got set up by another game warden dove hunting. The game warden actually baited the field that the game warden was hunting and gave him a ticket. And he would have never got out of it or approved it if he wouldn't have been a game warden himself. It had been someone like myself or you guys or anybody else's podcast that didn't have the credibility with the law enforcement that could have got a ticket. And that's what scares me from the standpoint of uh, the federal laws on baiting. And even, uh, Chad, even even I, I, I truly... Uh, question the wing on situation you go to Canada I mean I, I eat ducks and I eat, eat geese um, and I don't shoot them just to shoot them I shoot them because I like to eat them and you've been up there with me where we're eating mallard, <laughs> mallard three times a day we'll go Canada goose hunt about once or twice and you got so much <laughs> meat it takes you so much so much time to eat them yeah. we don't typically hunt big Canada geese on the road because we harvest what we want to eat and when you go up there and you're having successful hunts and you have to leave a wing on a bird, and so then you freeze it in a bag and then you cross the border and then you bring it back and then you thaw it out and you cut that nasty wing off and then you do the process again, uh, it's not that I'm lazy. It's just it's pretty nasty. It's pretty dirty. I don't, I don't feel like that meat is as fresh and edible as I like it for it to be. And so I refuse to do that. So that's why we shoot and we eat what we shoot that day or prepare it for the next day or what have you. Um, And I just know that a lot of those birds are probably not seeing the table because of that. And there's a lot of things we could do as hunters to try to make things better for everyone involved. I love this idea. Can we talk about it, Freddie? Huh? Let's talk about this idea. Maybe we'll call it think with zinc. (laughs) Um. Well, here's the deal when you're taking a wing across. I've been on two occasions in the last three seasons. One of them happened this last season where the <laughs> the game warden couldn't identify the wings on the birds. He was like, well, this is a widget. And I'm like, no, it's not. That's not a widget. Yep. And I had to educate them. Like the identification goes across the board to where I've talked about it so many times of getting into waterfowl hunting. There are so many rules and laws and regulations from the state level to the fed level. I mean, you got to educate yourself. And then you start talking about ca- crossing straight uh, state lines and hunting in different areas, man. It's and different. I mean, just from the limits to the identification, to the shooting hours, to the, uh, the you know, the, the big one in waterfowl hunting, you've already mentioned it is party hunting. So I'd love to get on there and educate people and talk about it because you listening to you talk you can throw down and you have so much knowledge of this of this scope and of this of these topics that we're touching on i think that'd be a great idea just so people want to learn and that's what you've been so good at for years is teaching and getting new people involved yeah i just just think there's a lot to talk about and a lot of things we can do as a community to try to help resource skip would you listen to it no that's a really that's a great point if you did it in inviting and um a way that really is encouraging because it, it is daunting, man. I've been down there in Southern Louisiana, Venice. There's a one pintail limit and there's female gadwalls flying around and a juvenile hen pintail. And I mean, good luck. You just, you, people need to just, when, when in doubt, don't shoot. It's hard. It's very hard sometimes. Well, there's just you, like Freddie said, there's just too much gray area. There's just too much. Right. I was in Colorado here um, two years ago with that crew of killers, and we're walking around this field. I'm like, oh, good, there's a lot of waste grain. Freddie was talking about the lack of waste grain anymore. There was some corn laying around and stuff, and I thought it was cool. But by the time we put out this giant X-shaped spread across this pit, we had all stepped on enough 
large um, cobs of corn, but there were bright yellow piles everywhere. And I'm like, this guy has some, it's a small field. He had some antiquated farming equipment, or maybe he didn't want to harvest enough that year. I don't know exactly what happened, but I remember thinking, am I legal now? This feels very uncomfortable. I've never hunted with little bright piles of yellow corn here, even though it's open season and that's clearly waste grain, it could be a problem. And even for someone who's in the industry, in the editorial waterfowl magazine, I was like scratching my head. Um, yeah, I've been and, there where I, I it, was, it was scary. You've had those 35 I birds. Do, let's do a series, Freddie. Let's do a whole series on the education. I know that we're getting off topic here, but I think that what Freddie is saying is needed and to do it right and invite the right people in to lay this stuff down because I don't want to get in trouble. I don't want people to be scared or intimidated. And I don't know how many times it's happened to Freddie, which I know way more than me, but I get invited by outfitters and people like, hey, love you to come hunt. And, the, and the, you, you want to say yes to all of them, but you just don't know. And then you hear yeah. these horror stories of of the undercover and all of that stuff i want people to look at somebody like fred zinc and be like that's a good voice that's an ambassador of this he's doing it the right way to get people involved for the right reasons we don't need to try to get somebody like that in trouble we need to work with these voices that have these platforms to do it the right way because duck hunting is intimidating and it's expensive there's so many negatives to get into this and it's that's why the the least number of hunters in our country are duck and goose hunters according to the the numbers of deer hunters and turkey hunters and predator hunters and so forth there's barely two million people that duck hunt because it's expensive it's difficult and it's intimidating in my opinion so i think we ought to do it yep i'm down i'm down there's a bunch of topics to talk about i think it'd be i think it'd be a lot of people that jump on board uh, we just need a voice. It's not that the, the, the state or the feds are trying to do anything maliciously or penis, but I think it's just old antiquated uh, rules and laws that need to really be taken taken a look at from the standpoint of modern society and the technology that we have today, just to keep it real, you know? I, I'm going to call you and we're going to talk about this because I would love to be a part of it to to get okay. this out there. We'll think of some names. Seaboy and Freddie Z. Seaboy, <laughs> Freddie Z and Seaboy. <laughs> this has been another episode. Skip, thank you for being here, co-hosting the Wildfowl 2021-22 Giant Gear Issue. We're making this. Good to see you, Skip. We're making this a tradition. Get your hands on this magazine. Freddie Zink, Avian X Zink calls the Goose Master himself. We didn't even talk about what's new, but you guys can look at the new gear issue and see some of the new calls Freddie has. Zinkcalls.com. He has kick some butt in this industry freddie we're going to see each other during the season but for sure we'll see each other at nwtf in nashville or what 100 percent now yep all right we're hanging I'm ready to roll. It's, it's been another episode of the foul life podcast 2021 wildfowl giant gear issue thank you all so much for listening thank you to my co-host skip Knowles. thank you to the one and only the master fred zinc we'll have more episodes coming your way soon get your new wildfowl gear issue now on newsstands or in your mailbox everybody get geared up have hopefully you're having some success in the early canada goose in south dakota north dakota all of those states up in that area stay safe out there if you're going across the border with the vaccination good luck up in canada say hello to our families and friends north of the border i'm chad belding this is 2am logic the song is called my foul life 